Chip Ingram has come our way before, and uh, a lot of you have read his books. A few months ago, I interviewed him about uh, his latest book, Overcoming Emotions That Destroy. Uh, terrific book, and I'm sure a lot of you have already picked it up and, uh, and read it. He's got an, another book that uh, we wanted to talk to him about. It's called Finding God When You Need Him Most. And uh, Chip, it's just terrific to have you back. Thank you. Welcome. Good to be here. I, I found this book to be so interesting because you, you really start with um, some of the, uh, uh, the critical mass of general human need, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's, it's injustice or uh, some kind of a crisis or a sense of personal insignificance, fear, depression, guilt, uh, confusion. Uh, and the, uh, the thing I found quite intriguing is that even though you've got a lot of good things to say, you root your wisdom in um, an exposition of uh, some chosen psalms. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a trivia book. How, 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 did, how did this come about? Well, I was in uh, Santa Cruz, California, pastoring at the time, and you have some of these windows that you look back and you say, God, I just was amazed to be a part of it. But we literally had hundreds of people who came to Christ in a very short amount of time. And we were a fairly large church and large staff, but we just couldn't handle them. And the backgrounds they came out of, uh, it, it's, a, it's a pagan culture. I don't mean that in a negative way. Yeah. They just, I mean, I was sharing it in new members class when, you know, the big numbers in the Bible are called chapters and the little ones are called verses. So They're, we're talking total uh, biblically literate here. No exposure, but genuine encounters with God, coming to Christ, but multiple marriages, um, heroin addictions, sexual addictions, and we couldn't counsel them all, but they were eager and open. And so I thought, well, what are the top seven or eight major issues that we're counseling people on? And since we can't counsel them, I thought, I'll do a series in church that takes them where God speaks to them directly. And so I thought, okay, you know, David, he commits murder and adultery, and Psalm 51 is his journey when you've blown it big time. Well, we've got all these people who've blown it big time and he walks them through a process or, you know, some people have been ripped off or their mate walks out on them. It's an injustice. Well, what do you do when you get a raw deal or uh, when you're in the midst of a huge crisis? So we went through each of these huge times and I would have someone in the church who was vulnerable and willing to share where they were at and then we'd walk people through this psalm so then they could go to it themselves. And it was an amazing journey where we saw God become the counselor in our church. I'm just turning to that chapter actually where uh, it's entitled, When You've Blown It, Big Time. Right. You've, you've really blown it. And, and that, that 51st Psalm, uh, you know, the first few verses, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, mm -hmm. cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions, my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, done what's evil in your sight, so that you're proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. This is David probably uh, addressing the Lord after the Bathsheba yes. incident, right? Right. So he's, he's the king. His priorities got out of whack. He commits adultery. He covers it up, right. murders her husband. And then best we can tell, it's at least a year or maybe longer where he's living with this secret. And then the prophet comes, tells him a little story. He gets called on the carpet and he owns his stuff. And what we get is, this is a man after God's own heart who when he actually admits, I blew it. What process does he go through? Not just to be restored, it's interesting, but to get back on track to be greatly used by God in the future. Now, we all have a natural reflex when we blow it big time yeah. to hide it. Absolutely. I mean, if we're confronted with it, we want to lie, yeah. right? No, no, I didn't do that. No, no, no. Or we, we try to rationalize it or, or somehow uh, explain it away. Yeah. You know, I, I was under a lot of pressure then. There were mitigating circumstances, yada, yada, yada. Um, you make the point that when you approach the Lord, there's, there's no lies, there's no mm -hmm. deception, there's no cover up. And that's a big part of the problem in, 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 in getting to find the Lord, is it not? You gotta go naked. Uh, I, lo I love the Psalm 145 says, uh, the Lord is near to those who call upon him. Hmm. To those who call upon him in truth. One of the things about people that don't know anything about the Bible and haven't been religious, they take things at face value. And they, they don't have all this junk to work through. Right. They've got their own junk. But you know, to be able to say to someone, who's had a couple of abortions, who've been through a couple marriages, who's robbed someone. I mean, we had just all over the map. And so here's the deal. 
the moment you will get ruthlessly honest with God. And if you will come and own your stuff, don't blame anyone else and say, God, I blew it. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? You need to understand you don't have to feel bad for two weeks or two months or three days. He will forgive you and take you through a process. And you see that process in Psalm 51 where he owns it. He pours out his heart. And then, you know, what we want to do is kind of pay it back. Well, I'll try and be a good person. And David tells us, no, if burnt offerings is what you wanted, if you wanted religious activities, I would have brought it. The, he says, no, here's, here's what God wants. A broken mm -hmm. spirit and a contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. And it's out of our brokenness that actually God does some of the deepest and best stuff in us. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had people who, uh, we had a man in the church who had a hidden sexual addiction for 30 years who finally came clean with his wife, who shared it in front of the entire church. His name's Andy. Uh, mm -hmm. His wife's on the front row. Uh, and he, he, he went to another city uh, for about four months and got in a, in a group and began to learn and grow. And then he went public. And uh, we launched at the end of that service. We said, if you're willing to be really clean, no one will judge you here. Andy's taken a courageous moment. His wife's on the front row. Uh, he lived a lie for 30 years. It started as an eight-year-old at a Sears magazine looking at lingerie and progressed for 30 years. We launched uh, eight or nine sexual addiction groups for men that Sunday night. And now Andy's helped people uh, all over America. Every time I speak on this, who's Andy? I say, call Santa Cruz Bible Church and he'll just help you. And that's what God wants to do for some of the people listening right now. We're afraid to own it. We're afraid of what people think. It takes courage. But when we do, you know, remember that, that prayer toward the end, he says, mm -hmm. not only forgive me, restore to me the joy of your yeah. salvation. Yeah. And then he asked God, will you use me again? Yeah. Will you use me again? Yeah. And what, what I love here, you know what? This book, I didn't grow up in the church and I didn't grow up ever reading the Bible. Yeah. But I, when I read this for the first time, it was like, wow, prostitutes? James and John, anger management issues, yeah. big mouths like Peter, murderers like Paul. I'm thinking Moses is a murderer, Paul's a murderer. I haven't even killed anyone. I think God could use me, you know? <laughs> but, but, but that's the gospel. I mean, so this is what it's about. <laughs> and, and something else that strikes me about that terrific 51st Psalm is, is David's understanding of sin. He says it's against you. Yeah. You only. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because there are those who would say he sinned against Uriah, who sure. he killed, or he sinned against Bathsheba, or he sinned against the, his people, or sinned against his family. Well, those are all maybe subsets mm -hmm. of the big one. And the big one is his sin against God, yeah. which is absolutely amazing. Well, and I think when we get it vertical, then we start dealing with the real issue. I think a lot of times what we're trying to do is figure out how to get forgiveness and negotiate the consequences of the sin instead of realize I broke God's heart. Yeah. It's a relationship. Yeah. I hurt my father. Yeah. That's the heart of sin. And when, when you begin to see that, that changes whether you sin in the future. But there's a difficult question here and you talk about it in the book. Someone blows it big time mm -hmm. and their conscience tells them, their upbringing tells them, you don't deserve mercy. Yeah. You deserve to be punished big time. Mm -hmm. You deserve to be miserable for the rest of your life, you rotten rat. Yeah. You know, we're so hard on ourselves. How do you get over that? I mean, it, God, God is angry at sin. He's, 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 he's just and, and sin has consequences. How do you get over the, the, the fear that the Lord will reject you and or the fear that you've sinned so badly that mm -hmm. there is no way under heaven that God will ever forgive you. Well, I think we got to get back to having clear theology. Right. And the clear theology is um, you couldn't do anything to earn God's favor. Right. And what Jesus did on the cross covered all sin for all people mm -hmm. at all time. Mm -hmm. and, and here's what I heard as a pastor for many, many years. Well, I know God forgave me. I just can't forgive myself. And so they live in this world and, and there's this psychological issue that we do. We, we play this game. Some people hate themselves so they eat a lot, so they don't look good, so they, oh good, now I'm punishing myself. It's a weird deal. And, and, and so what happens is we need to understand is that God's forgiveness is complete 
And my issue when I say I can't forgive myself, I am insulting God, insulting the work of Christ, and telling God, oh, this is good enough for you, the, the creator of the entire universe, but it's not good enough for me.